So with some of the background stuff out of the way um, from our past two videos, uh, let me from now on describe in detail the typical methods that Woodpole inspectors should follow when inspecting, testing, and treating in-service Woodpoles. Now, um, for those people that don't know what I'm talking about in uh, getting the background stuff out of the way, well, this video is actually part of a playlist that contains all the videos for this wood pole inspection course. So if you're actually interested in viewing the entire course, please visit the playlist link that I've left in the video description below. I mean, if you are coming from uh, and have read all the background stuff, good. So let us get started. Although the pole inspection process is essentially the same for all wood utility poles, evaluation criteria, pole markings, treatment requirements, and other components of the process may differ from one utility to the next. And inspectors will be better prepared to follow specific utility standards if they have full understanding of the methods detailed in this course. However, though, my course doesn't give you um, particular details that may be pertaining to the particular utility company that you serve. So always after this course, you should look at in detail the guidelines and the procedures that, um, that is listed by the utility company that you are working with. Now out in the field, you will come across four different types of wood poles. So they can be full length treated, non-treated, stub poles, or butt treated. So let's briefly go through each pole type first before I move on to the inspections. Now poles that have been placed in a treating cylinder and for which the preservatives have been driven into the sapwood under pressure and thus treating the entire length of the pole are known as what we call the full length treated poles. Now the majority of poles in service are actually full length treated in many utilities. Many full length treated poles have been used uh, for more than 40 years and inspectors must be thorough in conducting their inspections since while the exterior of a pole may appear to be in fine condition, the interior may actually be fully deteriorated. This is especially true for pine and Douglas fir poles which have low natural resistance to decay fungus and if not frequently inspected and treated with preservatives can have actually a relatively short service life. Non-treated poles, on the other hand, are poles that were installed without being treated with a wood preservative and as a result have a limited service life unless they're located in an area with long, severe winters. Poles that have not been treated make up a relatively small percent percentage of all poles in service and the most majority have been treated with a preservative bandage. For stub poles, it refers to a wood pole attached to a stub which is typically what we call a short length of wood pole, timber, sheet, or other suitable material put in the ground with its purpose being to give the support that the pole butt originally provided. Lastly, poles that have had their bottom 8 to 12 feet commercially treated with creosote or an oil borne preservative such as pentachlorophenol are known as butt treated poles. Standing the poles upright in a vat of preservative, heating the vat to remove moisture from the poles, and then cooling the preservative as it is absorbed into the sapwood of the pole are all part of the treatment procedure for the butt-treated poles. And the majority of butt-treated poles are made of western red cedar, which has a relatively thin sapwood but very resistant hardwood to rot fungus. Generally, there are seven different types of inspections, and they are the above ground inspection, partial below ground, below ground, in concrete, partial in concrete, and stub. Let us go over each one of these. Let us start off with above ground. Above ground by far covers the majority of the inspection process, and it is divided between external and internal and their inspections targeting the pole above the ground line. Let us start with external inspection. External inspection is basically a visual evaluation of a pole or stubs above ground zone. Defects that are too high up the pole to be inspected properly must be recorded. When the inspection report is received, the local utility company will arrange for a qualified person to climb the pole and inspect it. 
However, if visible deterioration or decay, for example, a broken pole top renders the pole unusable or dangerous, it should be repaired or replaced prior to climbing. Above ground visual inspections are performed to record information on the pole and its attachments, as well as to identify and document faults. The information gathered is either written down on paper or entered into an electronic data um, uh, collector um, or what we call information system, like in the form of um, an iPad or an iPhone or even through a computer. So what do we check with above ground ex external inspection? Well, the things that we look at include um, things such as pole tags, pole attachments, mechanical damage, wildlife damage, any signs of decays, uh, vertical checks, uh, vegetation, and uh, fire damage. So let me describe these one by one, starting with the pole tags. Manufacturer, year of manufacturer, class, length, wood species, and preservative treatments are all included on the pole tag. Note that the tag may be unreadable or non-existent on some older poles. And in these circumstances, the inspector can estimate the height of the pole and confirm the class using the ground line circumference. The inspector uses local knowledge of species and treatment to assess the age of the poles and can frequently determine the age from a pole date nail or the age of adjacent poles. Next, the number of primaries, secondary lines, guys, uh, communication cables, transformers, reclosers, voltage regulators, and as well as other equipment should be recorded as attachments. If the inspector has a GPS data recording equipment, the global coordinates of the pole are recorded as well for the utilities GIS system. For mechanical damage, motor cars, farm equipment, and snow piles can all gouge and damage poles. The load carrying capability of a pole is diminished when its circumference is drastically reduced. Calculations for uh, estimating any strength loss are similar to those used to evaluate surface rock pockets. And also, when a pole is overstressed, for example, when it is hit by a vehicle, lateral damage, a break or crack occurs, rendering the pole dangerous. A cracked pole should be replaced and reported to the local utility office as soon as possible. Now, as for wildlife damage, um, the most important ones are woodpeckers and insects. Small woodpecker holes, especially ones that follow cracks, do not weaken the strength of a pole much. Speaking of insect infestation, one or more of the following symptoms usually indicate an inf insect infestation, which is shown in front of you right now. And the four points are, uh, for example, you should check the entrance and exits of ants and termites from the pole. Um, you should also look at the foot of the pole as there are piles of wood fiber or sawdust like stuff that might indicate that there is insect infestation. Another thing is you should look for round or oval holes on the pole's surface, as well as underneath the surface of the wood, there are galleries that may or may not be filled with feces or other stuff. And that may also an indication that there are insect infestation on the pole. Now, aside for animal damage, we also need to look for decays. First of all, sapwood that is very loose or ragged, which is anything that is above one inch, must be reported on the report form because it poses a climbing danger to linemen. Secondly, uh, linemen should look out for any pole top rot that is evident when there are losses throughout the roof's outer circumference and or indentations along the apex. Also, section loss, surface corrosion, and evidence of decay surrounding bolt holes are all signs of cross-arm decay and should be recorded as well. Then there are vertical checks. Now, these checks can take place both before and after the pole installation. Checks do not actually affect pole strength, but do provide a pathway for decay spores to penetrate poles. Checks that go through bolt holes are dangerous and must be reported on the report form. Checks that do not run the length of a pole or across bolt holes are typical and do not pose a threat to the pole. Inspections should also include uh, looking at vegetation growth. Any vegetation growth that produces uh, a hazardous work, uh, work environment should be eradicated. And lastly, we should look at fire damage. Grass or shrub fires commonly cause fire injury to the lower pole body, which is generally only superficial. 
If the damage looks to be serious, however, remove the burned wood and assess the extent of the damage. Lightning or leakage current across contaminated insulators are the most common cause of fire damage high up on a pole. And these fire damage should be documented and reported in, um, in your recording during the pole inspection. Now, before we move on further into our course, let us take a brief look at our sponsor for this course. Now, as an engineer, especially when I first started in my career, I really felt overwhelmed the list of documents that we need to do on top of our technical work. Yet, these documents are very important in our career as it is the more prominent thing that displays our credibility to management and to our clients if we so decide to become an engineer consultant, which is where the real actual money is. Now, I don't have these tools available to me when I first started my career, but now PM Milestone has created this package of all the professional templates that you need so that you can focus more on the technical aspect of your career. These templates are tried and tested by real professionals, so you should feel confident in using them in your career to present your best foot forward in front of your manager or clients. These templates are also updated periodically, and I think their last update is just 2021, so they're not going to be out of date or context to the present times, as these people are serious in getting the most professional product to meet your needs. They're also very confident of the quality of these templates too, as they offer you their product completely risk-free with 60-day money-back guarantee if you are not satisfied with it. So. If you are interested in this product and would also like to support me in creating these courses on YouTube in the future, please check out their product using the link in my video description titled Course Sponsor PM Milestone 2.0. There are three main methods for internal inspection and they are sounding, probing, and drilling. Now, internal degradation in a pole or stub is detected via sounding. From the ground line to as high as one may be reached, a hammer is used to strike the pole surface to make the sound. A piercing ring denotes sound timber, but a hollow or dull thud implies decay or hollow heart. Sound can be affected by seasoning checks, internal checks, and shell rot. Suspicious regions should be investigated by drilling. Near the ground line, degradation is most likely to be encountered and occasionally severe rot will be discovered. At this point, sounding should be done all the way around the pole. If this happens, have the examination and notify the utility agent right away. On the other hand, probing is a technique for detecting degradation in checks and pockets that uses a scraper or screwdriver. Within deep checks and pockets, firm pressure is applied to the wood if the wood yields, rot should be suspected. Drilling will be used to check suspicious regions. Lastly, the third type of internal inspection is drilling, and there is a reason why I'm putting this last, because I want to talk more about this. Now, drilling is used to assess the quality of a pole's interior wood, and there are four areas with which holes should be drilled, and they are, first of all, uh, if whether or not internal decay is detected by sounding or probing, um, second point being in places where there is an insect problem detected. Third place is at 45 degrees from the vertical axis at the ground line. And the fourth place is at the, the steel stub near the lower holding band or bolt for stub pole with the hardwood stub near the lower holding band in both the stub and the pole. All, also, do take note that while drilling, the velocity at which the drill penetrates the wood, sound wood has a solid splintery quality and is tough. So quick collapse of the wood being drilled indicates rotten timber or hollow heart. Another thing is that insect infestation or dried out decay are indicated by powdery wood particles. Wood that has become discolored internal decay is nearly always indicated by particles such as extreme darkening. The wood may become mushy and spongy, stringy, or crumbly in the late stages of decomposition or decay, and caution must be taken not to confuse sound wet wood with rotten wood. And in this case, color is actually a very helpful identifier. You should also pay attention to the smell during drilling, as the fragrance of sound wood is usually clean, fresh, and resinous, with cedar having a particular 
odor. A musty or mushroomy odor, on the other hand, could indicate decay or deterioration. And last but not least, at the conclusion of the inspection, all holes must be fixed and closed with treated wood or plastic dowels. So what should you do when you found decay through drilling? Well, you should drill two more holes evenly spaced around the ring of the pole at the same horizontal plane if internal decay is discovered. Then, with a shell thickness indicator, you should measure the thickness of the shell through the three holes. The greatest measurement is ignored for calculating the effective shell thickness, and the average of the other two is used instead. A correction factor is applied to the result. The value of this adjustment factor is determined by the drilling angle. And of course, the calculation method is indicated in the standards that I have discussed in a previous video. The average radial thickness of the outer sound wood around an interior deterioration is the effect shell thickness of a pole. Another thing you should do is to measure the pole circumference while you're at it. Removing any remaining shell rot and measure the circumference with a flexible tape wrapped firmly around the pole or stub at the spot where the shell rot was removed. Also, measure the circumference at the ground line if there was no shell rot. Next is the partial below ground inspection. Now, partial inspection refers to exposing only one quadrant of the pole by digging up to 24 inches deep, depending on the utility's specifications. Partially below ground examinations are occasionally utilized as the first step of a below ground inspection. And if no shell degradation is observed in the first quadrant, the method is used to prevent a thorough um, ex uh, below ground excavation that we're going to discuss later. And in this case, the exposed pole is drilled, treated, and examination is completed if no external or internal degradation uh, or decay is discovered. And if a section of existing bandage is removed during the process, it must be replaced with a fresh bandage section. Similar to above ground, uh, below ground inspections has external and internal inspection type. One thing I want to note with below ground excavation is that you should excavate a pole only if it is safe to do so. Notify the utility right away if the pole is rusted through at the ground line or is not set deep enough. The setting depth must be at least 10% of the pole height plus 2 feet. And from the bottom of the pole, the gain is around 12 feet. If the people does not have a setting gain, the setting depth can be estimated using the pole tag. Let us start off of, uh, with external inspection, which just actually contains two steps. The first step is to dig um, to a depth of two feet around the pole, and to expedite backfill and clean up, excavated dirt should be spread on tarpaulins. The sod on lawns should be scraped back before to excavation and replaced properly once the operation is finished. Also, special tools should be used where poles are set in concrete or black top as needed. And the second step is using a chipper, scraper, or wire brush, remove any old bandages from the pole and shave off any shell rot exposed by the excavation. Look for exposed pockets and checks and remove any rotting wood with a scraper or screwdriver. As for internal inspections, there are three steps for below ground inspection. And um, the first step is to use a hammer to strike the pole. And if you suspect any, any interior decay, um, drill to confirm it. The second step requires you to drill 45 degrees below the, 30, uh, the vertical axis at the ground line and check the effective shell thickness um, if there is any decay, um, which you should uh, need to find the effective shell thickness in order as a reference point for this. Now, lastly, for the third step, if the pole is good and is serviceable, it will be treated with a preservative. And before bandage is placed, all drilled holes should be fumigated and plugged with treated wood or plastic dowels. And uh, checks and pockets will be filled with preservative grease. And I will talk about preservative, uh, preservatives in a later video. Now, as you can see, the internal inspections are very similar to the above ground inspections. And also the principal uh, decay or degradation zone of a pole may be considerably below the ground line under dry sand or gravel soil conditions. Utilities will have experienced pole failures two to three feet below the ground line in areas where these conditions present. If this is the case, a second drilling check should be carried out from the excavation's bottom. 
Next, let us look at um, oh, checks for complete or partial in concrete. Poles set completely in concrete or asphalt that cannot be disturbed, whether non-treated, but treated, or full length treated, do not need to be inspected below ground. You should just inspect these poles above ground, drill two holes 180 degrees apart at ground line and angle toward at around 45 degrees if the pole is adequate. If internal decay is discovered in either drill hole at the ground line, the pole is suggested for stubbing or, or replacement depending on the local utilities guideline or policies. As for uh, stub poles with wood stubs, they're typically two sets of fasteners or bands, one being towards the top of the stub and the other near the ground line. Due to changes in road slope, the bottom bands may become buried after installation. When a band is buried, it is vulnerable to rot. The earth covering the buried bands should be removed as much as feasible. And on the report uh, form or the data collector interface, loose or damaged bands must be noted and recorded. You should examine the pole as well as the stub above ground as well. The bottom bands of both the pole and the stubs are drilled in pole stub with wood stubs. Steel stubs are drilled near the lower attachment on pole stubbed with steel stubs. So what comes after all of these inspections? Well, you will need to backfill and firmly tamp the excavated hole around the pole after inspection and treatment. Backfilling those uh, objects, turf debris or damaged asphalt is not recommended. Backfilling must be done with caution so as not to harm the bandages. The pole may be recognized for future action if it is indicated for um, stubbing or replacement. And the roadside side of the pole's face, for example, is blazed approximately six feet above ground and a six to five to six inch diameter red circle is painted on the blazed surface or a utility marker is used to indicate that the pole requires stubbing. Likewise, a five to six inch diameter solid red dot or a utility marking is also used to indicate that the pole needs to be replaced. Another thing that should be done is underneath the date nail or the pole tag attach the relevant identifying tags. Remove broken pavement and debris from the location, then fill up the report form or the data collector as needed by the utility company. As mentioned in the introduction of this course, I highly recommend you to take my Distribution Power Engineering Fundamentals course or the Transmission and the Distribution Line Infrastructure Fundamentals course to gain core knowledge of the distribution power poles that we're looking at in this course. These two courses will provide you not only the prerequisite knowledge that you need to understand what I'm talking about in this course better, but also provide you with essential industry knowledge that will no doubt help you propel your career to the next level. Also, upon completion of the courses, you will get a certificate of completion, which you can show to your current or potential employer that you have mastered these fundamental concepts. I have left the links to my two courses in the video description below, so be sure to check it out. Also, this video is part of a playlist that contains all the videos for this wood pole inspection course. So if you are interested in viewing the entire course, please visit the playlist link that I have left in the video description below. Thank you for watching and I will see you in my other videos.